Retina Rounds, episode number 180, Combination Cataract Surgery and Vitrectomy. In this episode, we'll explore key considerations and best practices for performing combined cataract and vitroretinal surgery, covering preoperative planning, intraoperative strategies, and postoperative care. I'm joined by my co-moderator, Dr. Esan Rahimi, and together we'll share insights to help optimize outcomes when treating complex cases that require both anterior and posterior segment surgery. All right. Thanks for joining us today. Pradeep, we've got some fun cases to talk about here. I think we're going to start it off with uh, one of my favorite types of cases to do is combination cataract and vitrectomy. And just give a little background here. This is a patient who has PDR, uh, their chronic intravitreal anti-VEGF injections uh, for chronic refractory DME. They keep getting recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. Um, they've had previous PRP. They have a progressive cataract. And this is one of those things, you know, pretty from our standpoint, we know this is multifactorial, but from a patient's perspective, they just notice that their vision is getting worse and they're invested in, in doing whatever to like optimize their vision. How are you approaching these types of uh, situations and, and dealing with these cases? Yeah, so so we actually dealt uh, with this a lot at the county hospital where I was the chief um, for, for a number of years. Uh, a lot of diabetic patients who have both cataracts, and, visually significant cataracts, and um, diabetic eye disease that requires a vitrectomy. In this case, it's a recurrent hemorrhage, but it could, could be a TRD. It could be a variety of different things. And my general preference is to try to stage these cases. And I, I know that that's not you know, a universally held feeling, but my, my thought process is this. Uh, and this is partly colored by the fact that we were doing these cases in a, in a safety net hospital uh, with trainees, right? So um, these aren't seasoned cataract surgeons. They're still learning cataract surgeons, but still very, they're very good surgeons. So my, fe my feeling is oftentimes we were doing these cases on patients who had complex TRDs, the vitrectomy itself is complicated. And when you don't have a good view, it makes that, <laughs> makes the surgery even more difficult. If you do epithelial debridement, you only have then a certain amount of time before the, the edema just progresses and you, just, you kind of have very few options to try to maintain a good view. Um, and I never wanted to get into that situation with a combo case. So if I've got sort of a, a, a less experienced surgeon who may encounter a complication or maybe is using morphic, morphic emulsification power and the cornea is a little bit more compromised than it would normally be, that could compromise the view down the road. That's one reason. Um, and so that's why I, that's one reason why I prefer a staged approach. The second is oftentimes I'm putting in some sort of a tamponade agent in the posterior, uh, posterior segment. So I'm putting in air, gas, whatever it may be. Um, even in an uncomplicated case, let's just say it's just a non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage and putting air in the back of the eye for a number of the reasons that we've discussed last week. And, um, and so with, with the air bubble there or gas bubble, whatever it may be, it can sometimes, the buoyancy can sometimes push the lens out of position. Um, and so if that rexus isn't the right size, that IOL can then pop out of the bag and you might have an edge of the optic in the sulcus, which can result in chronic inflammation. And these are already eyes that are, that are, um, that are compromised. They have uh, existing DME. They're really, it's really not a good uh, situation to have uh, ongoing uh, inflammation from uh, this lens sitting in the sulcus position. So for those two reasons, I've always been in favor of staging the surgery. Um, with that said, I think the biggest drawback of doing that, especially in individuals who maybe have other medical comorbidities, is getting them back to the operating room is not an easy task. And so, you you know, it's inconvenient for the patient and, you know, their, their medical condition may not allow you to have um, sequential surgery in such a way that, you know, it, it's, it can be done within a timely fashion. So I understand that that's the downside. But for me, I'm thinking long term. I think long term, that's probably the safest option. Now, when uh, combo surgery is done, I think the most important thing, kind of going back to the, making sure that the lens stays in the right position, is to make sure that that rexus isn't too big, it's not too small. It's got to be just the right size, so there's good anterior capsular overlap uh, on top of the 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 um, the optic, um, so that lens stays in position. I also prefer to put a three-piece lens in place for these eyes uh, when I'm doing a combo surgery, um, and and that's for two reasons. Um, sometimes the the post the uh, the red reflex isn't very good. You know, heaven forbid they get, uh, you know, there's there's some sort of um, posterior capsular violation. At least the lens can be put in the sulcus, so we're prepared for that. And two, even if it goes in the bag, 
if for some reason that optic pops out, I think the edge design of the three-piece lens is a little bit more forgiving for being in, in the sulcus position compared to a single-piece IOL. So I like to put a three-piece lens in these these types of eyes. What what what, do you, what are what are your thoughts? I, th I think you really elucidated pros and cons of this very nicely. I think for a lot of patients, it ends up being somewhat of a personalized decision. And especially you mentioned some of these patients, like the one I think we're going to watch and discuss, they're diabetics. They have a lot of medical comorbidities. Assuming this is something that's potentially bilateral, is this something somebody wants to go to the operating room four times to address? And again, these are discussions we have with these patients, especially now more than ever, like access to OR is at such a premium. It's, it's so difficult to get cases into operating rooms as well too, let alone the potential real risk of medical comorbidities and, and, and risk of anesthesia for these patients in the recovery. So um, I go back and forth. I have plenty of patients that do stage surgeries. I have plenty of patients that opt for combination surgeries. All of your tips and points will highlight again in this case are critical though. And at least in my practice, ignoring the aspect of patients who are sick, vascular paths or diabetics, I have plenty of patients that have puckers, you know, some cases I've done it for holes too, but typically it's more like puckers or protracting for opacities if they have concurrent cataracts, they opt for a combination surgery, just kind of knock it all out with one trip to anesthesia. But that's where I will bring in some of my expert cataract surgeons who I've worked with for well over a decade who deliver reproducible, reliable results with their cataract surgery. Because what you said is critical. You need to have a perfect rexus, not too big, not too small. You don't want to risk this IOO. Uh, displacing potentially post-operative. You want it to be well-centered. You want them to be quick and efficient, right? Especially if I'm doing uh, a pucker to follow them doing the cataract, the view is just going downhill. You know, if you're doing too much time cataract and you start getting corneal edema, your view's not great. You're going back to feel the pucker. So all these things kind of line up. And yeah, if you're not used to doing these, if you don't have a good partner whom you, you trust to do these, and again, in our practice, we've been doing this for over 10 years, pretty reliably, this can kind of spiral out of control, you know, and, and you can see how things can get a little bit dicey in these type of cases, but the setup and again, who you're doing these with, are, I think are critical for success. So we'll talk about it as we go through this case. Yeah, so I think, uh, I believe in this particular case, just this patient had a high degree of astigmatism. They were um, eligible for a, a toric eye well. Um, I believe it was ended up just, being donated via uh, like a, because a fellow was involved or a trainee was involved in this particular case, which was optimal for the patient. So cataract surgery goes pretty smoothly here. I think we can potentially uh, ask for Uday's input. You want to get cataract coach on here and see if he has any thoughts? Looking good so far. I mean, uh, I like the Rex's size. Not certainly not too big. So in, in these types of cases preview. You mentioned you like a three-piece IOL typically? I like a three-piece IOL. Also, I think um, uh, being very generous with a dispersive viscoelastic to protect that endothelium is really important too. Um, I think that the operating in this plane is really good. It's not too close to the corneal endothelium, so it's not going to mm -hmm. compromise the view. Uh, obviously, want to keep the uh, amount of energy down. I like the technique overall, the lens, lens disassembly technique. Um, overall, you know, this, the cataract surgery here looks looks very good. Yeah, pretty smooth. I agree with you. It's just I'm being mindful of where they're doing a lot of this work and what plane, just trying to steer clear, being too close to the endothelium, putting in protective viscoelastic, as you said. One thing that I do a little differently is I, I will usually have at least my infusion line in before starting the FACO. I know not all surgeons like that. I think sewing the wound is really important. Don't just hydrate. It has to be sewn shut. 100%. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of the, the key take-homes here is make sure you suture that first wound. Once you start getting these trocars in, that's where you can kind of lose its competency. Then you start flattening the AC and the eyes getting soft. So whether you put your infusion in at the beginning of the case or or, um, you know, after cataracts and make sure you suture that main window. And you see here, this particular type of anesthesia administering subtenons block, is that what you're routinely doing now in your cases? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I think that um, I've transitioned to doing mainly subtenons blocks, um, you know, for all the reasons that we've discussed previously, there's risks with uh, retrobulbar blocks that are just unnecessary to accept. Um, so, you know, subtenons I find to be uh, perfectly adequate for um, anesthesia and echinesia during the case. 
one of the ways just prior to this, but you could see with focusing on doing a decent amount of anterior vitrectomy, at least when I'm with our trainees and you know our fellows, I, I emphasize any pseudophagia guy, I like to do a decent anterior vitrectomy, you know, break that anterior hyaloid phase. Now, in these combo cases, you have to be particularly careful. So if you're choosing to do these cases, you have to be really careful depending on, you know, the elasticity of this, this bag or capsule. Like I've seen cases where that can just get sucked right into the cutter. So you have to be very cautious while you're doing an anterior trachea. And, and honestly, these combo cases may be that type of situation where you may defer it all together and just go straight to the back. Yeah, and that's another benefit of doing it staged is that you can actually do a posterior capsulotomy after that lens has already been nicely secured and the, the anterior posterior capsular leaflets have, have uh, fused around the IOL because uh, it's in a more stable position at that point. So here's so the unsurprisingly here, this is the, the hyaloids down here, Pradeep. So what are you, how are you walking your, your fellows through these type of cases? You've done a lot of these diabetic you know, for, for, for diabetic um, PVD induction, I, I tend to uh, like to uh, use forceps, actually, um, because there can be a number of fibrovascular pegs. And if you pull with the cutter, sometimes it can pull a little bit too hard and it can create a break. Uh, this particular eye doesn't look like there's um, too much in the way of, um, uh, you know, tractional retinal detachment here, certainly. Uh, there might be some areas where there's some, um, some fib fibrovascular um, uh, fronds. Uh, and so it does put you at a little bit of a risk for a retinal break. Um, and so that's why I like the forceps because then you can just be very controlled. And then I just go back and forth between the forceps and the cutter. Uh, and if there are any breaks uh, or rather if there are any fibrovascular pegs, just uh, segment around those before uh, continuing to elevate the hyaloid. And you can see here actually in this infrotemporal uh, macula, there is in fact a, a little break here, uh, probably where there was a little fibrovascular frond and uh, which was integrated with the overlying vitreous and so that traction just pulled a little break there. Um, so yeah, I think forceps is just a safer approach. Usually diathermizing that? Yep. Just stop bleeding on its own, you diathermize? Yeah. Yep, I do, I do. Uh, well, and maybe not the entire uh, break, but certainly where the bleeding is coming from. It looks like it's coming from the, the, the part of the vessel. It looks like there's a vessel that goes right into that break. And so I'd probably just diathermize right where the bleeding is. Um, and so I like to go, uh, I'll usually go to a, a tamponade pressure I'll, using a back flush cannula. I'll just um, uh, remove the hemorrhage and then I'll slowly come down on the IOP. And as soon as I see where the source of the bleeding is, then I'll, I'll, then I'll re-engage the, um, the tamponade pressure, diathermize that spot, and then bring it down slowly again. Um, but, you know, this is certainly a reasonable approach to, to just diathermize the whole thing. I just would I just would be careful not to be overly aggressive, especially since it's in the posterior pole. Um, mm -hmm. Probably going to want to, you know, some surgeons will just leave those posterior breaks uh, without any laser, although I like to just apply a little bit of at least one row of uh, gentle laser around the break just to make sure that it's um, it doesn't turn into a detachment. Usually the posterior breaks, as long as you remove the traction, they are have a low likelihood of progressing to an RD, but I think just a little bit of laser is probably the safest thing to do. Copious amounts of steroid. What are your feelings about this in these types of cases? You're seeing, yeah, I, I, mean, it, you know, I, th like I think that I think that um, you know diabetic vitreous is very skittic. Uh, we've talked about this on retina rounds plenty of times, and I think it's really important to use triamcinolone to make sure that you've got the hyaluronide up. Now, I think the, the the PVD was induced previously. So whether another round of, of uh, tr tramcinolone is really necessary, that's you know up for debate. I don't think there's any harm as long as you're not leaving a lot of tramcinolone, in, tramcinolone in the eye. Um, and you can see a little bit of laser that's put around that posterior break, and, and it looks like now the case is done. What are you feeling about you suture wounds routinely? I don't. Um, so I'll uh, I'll remove the trocars. That's why I like to use air because I can easily see if I drip BSS over the over the sclerotomy whether or not. Um, there's any egress of air, and if there is, then I'll go ahead and, and suture it. I have a very low threshold for suturing, uh, but not routinely. Yeah, for quicker cases, it's also gonna... not necessary, I don't think. Yeah. I wonder if a lot of that's going to change, you know, with the the new Alcon Unity coming out, and allegedly the, the 27 is going to be as good as the 25 we're used to. Will that kind of get rid of the need for any residual suturing in these cases? I'm wondering... It could. I, mean, I think it all depends on the fluidics. I have I have demoed the 27 on Unity. I find it to be close to 25 as we currently experience it on the Constellation. Um, but, uh, you know, the the more um, 
the the smaller the size that oftentimes the more torquing uh at the at the trocar the more stress on the wound and so the smaller size may be outweighed by that extra stress on the wound so we'll, we'll wait to be i think i think there will be a, a, sh a short learning curve for experienced surgeons to be able to use that and hopefully it will decrease the the risk for post-operative wound leaks and hypotony and uh, endophthalmitis One last thing I'd mention as a pearl too, I think it was utilizing this case. I could tell the pupil was coming down at the end is reaching for some, you know, myostat or myocol at the end. If you're potentially worried that that rexus may be a little too big, or if you have a tampon on there, you're worried about it potentially displacing that lens. I've used that in certain, certain cases and, and thus far I haven't had any issues with it. So yeah, that's great. yeah, thanks for your, for your discussion points and pearls. And thanks for joining us on this particular case. We have more, More good ones coming your way. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.